And all right, whew, technology. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's, I'm very excited to have uh, Kirby Breda, Brady be joining us here. Uh, so when Kirby and I first connected a couple of months ago, actually, um, she had a different role. Uh, she has since been promoted to the Chief Innovation Officer for the City of San Diego. Uh, and prior to joining the City of San Diego, uh, this is the bio that I sent around to you all, but uh, I feel like for the sake of completeness, uh, I'll go through it pretty quickly. Uh, prior to joining the City of San Diego, Kirby uh, worked for the San Diego, is that the EDC? Um, Kirby, is that right? Yeah. The Economic Development Corporation. Uh, overseeing the research efforts for the organization, focusing on local economic trends, uh, quantifying economic activity of regional industries, uh, and evaluating policy impacts. She also spent seven years working for SANDAG, which is the San Diego Association of Governments, on long-range population and housing forecasts for uh, the greater San Diego region. Her background is in urban planning, economic development, and long-range forecasting, uh, with experience in economic and demographic analysis, uh, and she uh, has done a lot of work with the media, uh, uh, you know, San Diego Union Tribune, Voice of San Diego, Business Journal here, uh, KPBS, etc. Uh, native San Diegan, uh, and she holds a bachelor's in regional development from University of Arizona, and a master's in urban planning from USC. Uh, and so she spends her free time exploring San Diego by bike with her husband and is always in search of the region's best burrito, which is kind of funny. One of my grad students did the side project, a data science side project of trying to quantify the best burrito in San Diego, <laughs> which uh, apparently was very contentious. He got local media for it and people very strongly disagreed. San Diegans care a great deal about their burritos <laughs> very passionately. Um, okay, so all of that said, uh, Kirby, it's, uh, I'm very excited that you're here. Thank you for joining us and taking the time. Uh, I'm sure you're pretty busy. Uh, and so I am going to shush and hand over everything to you. So thank you. Everybody, please welcome Kirby. Brady. Great. Thank you guys. Good to be here with you all. And um, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about what I do today. Um, I'll try to get through this slide deck as fast as I can. I don't love PowerPoint um, because I don't think it's a great way to facilitate a good conversation, but I think there's some background information just to give you an idea of what I do uh, before I would love to kind of open it up and maybe have a little bit of a discussion, answer any questions that you guys have, and I'd love to hear from you. So as Brad mentioned, um, my name is Kirby. I work for the city of San Diego, and um, the team that I run there is called Performance and Analytics. So it's essentially uh, the city's data team. We are affectionately referred to as Panda. And to give you an idea of what it is that we do. So I've got a really small department. Uh, there are about 15 of us and uh, we do a whole lot of things, but just to kind of condense it down to the main things that we do, we've got 15 people across three divisions uh, is what we refer to them as. The first is our tech innovation group, and they are responsible for uh, technology, customer centric technology. So, if any of you are familiar with Get It Done, uh, it is San Diego's 311 like customer service platform. It's an app. You can go and request things like filling a pothole, um, you know, street lights burnt out, all of these things that allow you to connect directly with us as the city to provide services. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. The second thing is we analyze a lot of data. So I have a killer data team, um, our data and analytics team, and we've got some, some pretty hardcore data scientists on our team. Uh, but I should say, I should stop and pause and say that data is really the, the foundation for everything that we do. So while we do have some you know, very rigorously trained data scientists, we also have the, mo the most of the folks on our team are actually just you know, data analysts in some form, uh, one way or the another. So we're all proficient uh, in, you know, there are numerous programming languages that we're using across the team, lots of different tools for visualization that we're using, um, all for different purposes. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So our data team are the ones that are now ingesting all this information uh, that we're pulling out of some of these data sets and programs across the city to make use of it. So that's where we have the opportunity to analyze a lot of city data to, to find ways to improve operations or services that we are delivering. And then the last uh, portion of our team is focused on process improvement. So these are the people that um, a few folks are Lean Six Sigma Black Belt trained. They will then see some of these, you know, areas of concern that we've identified through data analysis, whether they're operational inefficiencies, um, workflows or processes that can be improved. 
and they actually go into departments and work with them to improve uh, their operations. So we've kind of got this full system that you can kind of see here where no matter where uh, we work with a department or where they come into kind of this loop, we're kind of giving them this once over and we kind of do a whole lot of things with them, from helping them to improve the way they're storing or collecting data, trying to get them to you know, use our technologies to provide services in a more efficient manner. And then also, you know, obviously helping them improve along the way and analyzing where they're at in that process. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, I think most of what the public knows us for is get it done. Um, started as a pilot program back in 2016, really not a novel idea. It's just saying, hey, we should give the public a way to interface with us directly through technology. Uh, so if you are a resident of the city of San Diego or a customer, if you're doing business with us, it's really just this you know, simple idea that you should be able to go to one place for all of your needs. If you're trying to get a permit for your business, um, you shouldn't have to be poking around on our website to get to the development services department. Or if you're trying to get a pothole filled, you shouldn't have to be poking around looking for our transportation department. It's just, you should be able to go to one place to do all of these things. So we've continued to grow this platform. It started with just um, one department and a handful of services. It used to be referred to as the pothole app. And now we've got over 10 departments, city departments and services, over 50 services that we're providing through the app as well. So here just, you can see kind of what we refer to as those functional areas. These are the departments essentially that we're working with today. So you can see it really kind of ranges from everything from passport appointments through the city clerk's office, um, all the way to on the right hand side, things like transportation. So again, streets, um, you know, potholes, that sort of thing um, in the middle, parks and recreations, public utilities, even police. So there are certain services that we provide on behalf of our police department through the app as well. And I think the fun part of what we do is really when it comes down to analyzing the data that we that we have that we're collecting. So this is where I really want to talk about the, the power of being the keepers of all the data that comes into the city. So um, again, because we're working with so many departments, I told you about get it done, not because it's a wonderful app and we're doing all these cool things with it. But it's really because of the fact that every time we're providing a service to get it done, whether it's any of the um, services that you just saw on the previous slide or um, anything else, we are actually creating a record or a data point for that service. So now we're talking about all of these transactions that we're capturing um, every single day about city services that are provided. So of course, the, I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that now we have so much opportunity to start to investigate, um, think of ways we can even use the data that hadn't been thought of before, ways to improve, or even doing what um, our, our data and analytics team does, which is uh, maintaining our open data portal, which is you know, cleaning and processing our data and putting it out in a usable format so that students like you or anyone who's interested in civic innovation can pick up on our data sets and do big things that we didn't even know were possible. So there's also an opportunity to engage folks um, to help us solve problems that as government, we're not always able to solve on our own. So this particular map that you're seeing here, again, not the, the greatest map ever, but to take it to show you what you're looking at, um, this is a, a screenshot of a Tableau dashboard that we had created for our neighborhood policing department. And so they're responsible for uh, responding to calls of encampments in San Diego. And so we had, uh, after launching this new service type of encampments about a year ago, um, a year in, we realized we had all this information uh, about where encampments were popping up across the city. And so when you have an encampment, for instance, um, there are two types of uh, responders to that particular report. One would be neighborhood policing, and they come on site to help address any people that may be present. So people experiencing homelessness, maybe needing services of some sort, neighborhood policing will respond to that. Uh, the second responder would be the environmental services department they're going to come out because they're going to address any abatement issues if there's debris, if there's, um, you know, things that need to be moved out of the street, out of the right away, out of canyons, they're coming to do cleanup. And so here's an opportunity for us when we started marrying, marrying this data together, seeing ways for us to improve. And immediately the first thing that we found, just this isn't even by looking at the data, this is just us looking at the process, was that neighborhood policing would go out and environmental services would go out separately and neighborhood policing does their job to talk to people um, and if people are there they can help out and, and do, do something if people aren't there it's only for environmental services 
But what would happen is we would see neighborhood policing go out first. They would help address any issues with people that were present on site and they would leave. And then environmental services would come out and they would find that people had since returned to the site and then environmental services actually can't do any abatement or cleanup if there are people present. So the first thing we said is it makes a whole lot of sense and you would save a lot more money and time for the city if you guys just went out together and handled these issues at the same time. Um, where we're moving here and what you're seeing on this map is actually now using the data. So what we were able to do after a year's worth of collecting this information was to take a look at where we're seeing hot spots. So of course, this is just kind of at the aggregate level looking at these hot spots uh, for you all to see kind of where we were seeing the, the highest reporting um, incidences of these encampments. But now what we're looking at is moving into a more predictive space, which is now we know places where they're likely to pop up over based off of a variety of factors, um, data points that we're collecting through the reports that are coming in, either through submit people that are submitting the reports or through environmental services and police who are actually providing additional details when they complete this work. So now what we can do is move to a place to say, maybe there should just be some sort of regular kind of cleanup in these areas or regular sort of patrol in these areas. This should inform the routes that we're taking um, to actually address some of these issues. So that's kind of just one example of how we're using data to really inform those operations. A big part of what my team does is also providing some insight to department leadership. And so our job is both fun and challenging because we work with a, a lot of folks that are not data-minded. Um, we have to not only provide them ways to engage with their data, but then we have to do a lot in the way of explaining to them or educating them about what the data is telling them. So this is the part where um, soft skills really come into play. Um, I have a really talented and sharp team and they love to create all these you know, super fancy dashboards and you've got all these filters and all these things and their automated reports are fantastic. But then you sit them down with an executive and they, this executive has no knowledge of anything going on. You know, they don't care about the database. They don't care about, you know, whether this was done in Python or whether you, you know, are using R or Stata. Like what they want to know is how this informs their operations. And so this is the part where, you know, I'm cultivating with my team the ability to not only create these wonderful tools and resources for other people, but then also explain to them why these things are important. What is the actual operational insight that you know this department director or the mayor should be paying attention to? So here's an example of um, on this particular slide, nothing fancy. These are actually um, charts that I hate. These are standard charts uh, as they come out of Salesforce, which is the back end for our get it done. Uh, platform. And so we don't really have the ability to do a lot of customization. But the point is we spend time setting up reports that are tailored to our different audiences. And then once we've deployed you know, a report, so with this particular report for our environmental services team, they're receiving it, uh, depending on who you are, if you're kind of a line level worker, you may be getting something um, weekly. And if you are a director, you may getting you may be getting something daily. And the idea is that when they're huddling up to talk about things like, you know, their routes for the day or who's out sick and, you know, who's got to cover, we're able to give them real-time information about, you know, where there may be a higher number of reports of people that didn't have their trash cans picked up. Uh, we may be able to give them, you know, a little historical look at, you know, were there, was, was there some sort of alignment between where people were calling out sick and where we had higher reports in, in this collection, like how are the drivers performing on a daily basis. And so the idea is that we're giving them data that can then be the foundation for their discussions operationally um, from a management standpoint, instead of just talking about, you know, how you guys doing out there? You know, oh, you had a couple of packers go down. Sorry about that. Well, we'll just hit it next week. And it's like, well, no, you had a, you had a trash truck out of service and then you got 500 reports of people saying they're, they're their trash wasn't problematic. So we're trying to help them be data, more data informed in the way that they're approaching their work. So the next one here is um, similarly, again, not, please don't judge us for our data visualizations. We are finding and working with our audience that sometimes you just have to communicate things in very simple ways that they will understand. Um, this is a fun one for me because we were seeing for same department environmental services they were having a problem um, with a backlog of container delivery. So if you something happens, your, your trash can gets hit by 
I don't know, you know, somebody, a reckless driver or something, you order and your trash comes from the city, we have to deliver it to you. They weren't paying attention to some of these indicators that we were giving them, but what we saw in uh, kind of our review, our weekly review of their operations is that they had this backlog growing, uh, backlog being outstanding containers for delivery or any outstanding service we would refer to as a backlog um, if it hasn't been completed in the kind of uh, acceptable length of time. And so they had this backlog of containers growing, growing, growing. Um, they weren't even paying attention to it. They weren't even aware that they had a problem. But with my team, I think, you know, by, by nature of letting us in to your data sets and letting us kind of take a peek behind the curtain, we're also providing that customer service on a regular basis now where they may not be paying, to their, paying attention to their operations the way that we are. So when we spot problems, we flag them proactively for them. So in this case, they didn't even really know that their backlog for containers uh, was growing. We let them know and we implemented, this is exact, exactly what it looked like, this little gauge, these little indicators um, in their report. This became something that they were talking with their crews with every week. And now they're touting it as a success story that in a, a few months over last year, they were able to reduce their backlog of containers by 50%. And I recognize like in telling you all are my, my fellow data people here. Um, there is nothing novel about this other than us over communicating a problem to them. It's like they did not have a problem that we spotted for them and then gave them a very simple tool for them to you know, follow up on weekly. And I sat in a few of those calls and it literally sounded like this. Guys, look at how great we're doing. Look, we're actually moving the needle. Like these are the things that it's really sometimes that simple to get people <laughs> to address a problem. So. Just a fun example of, you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be some overly complicated um, report or tool that you're building for people. It just takes calling out, the, calling something to their attention, what we refer to as relentless follow-up. So we have another section I mentioned sort of our um, performance management section, which is our, our process improvement folks. And they do some really interesting work because they're actually going in again and um, working with departments to improve their operations once we find some of these areas of concern. Again, we can see all these things coming in through the service data that we're collecting. Sometimes it's really speaking to an inefficient problem. So for us, that could be looking at the ways that trash truck, you know, the drivers are out running their routes. And so we found through like looking at some of their GPS data that we were seeing these, you know, really inefficient routes that uh, delivery drivers had been, had, or sorry, uh, trash truck drivers had been um, taking. And we found out it was because there was something that was preventing them from making kind of these like left-hand turns in the street, like some design stuff. And so sometimes it's like, why are you driving, you know, 50 to 100 extra miles per day? And it's something really simple that could be fixed through like a routing software. So we see a lot of that. And again, sometimes the underlying problem isn't just that nobody's paying attention to something like a container delivery issue. Sometimes the underlying problem is a workflow or a process problem that actually needs some sort of improvement. So that's what our, our performance management section is doing. And um, these are kind of the areas that they're focused on. Strategic planning. So we're also working, uh, we are a part of the mayor's office. So we are now trying to bring data to the forefront of the conversations about that long range vision for the city of San Diego. This could be you know, our services that we deliver, how we're providing um, you know, how we're, how, we're, how we're making our decisions or resourcing uh, decisions for things like um, parks and recreation and library hours, et cetera. Data is at the, com at the forefront of the conversation for that. Um, equity, that's a huge issue for everything we do right now is how can we build in indicators around equity for everything that we're doing? So that is always the lens that we're viewing ourselves and measuring ourselves against. So you see all those things here kind of um, all the way down to motivating culture. We deploy surveys uh, to city employees. We spend a lot of time doing survey design um, to provide some insight to leadership, to the mayor, to the COO uh, about how employees are feeling. And so we're always doing things with and through the use of data, um, continuously monitoring, doing things in the way of, you know, not only collecting data, not only analyzing data, but then also, you know, targeting uh, specific initiatives, specific priorities, and kind of doing these deeper analyses to understand what's going on behind the scenes. So this and start here. Um, one example of what we're working on right now in this uh, 
in this team that's working on this process improvement work is called the balanced scorecard. And so this is again, nothing revolutionary, but you'll, you'll probably know these things commonly referred to as KPIs, key performance indicators. This is just saying, hey, we should kind of like baseline where we're at today um, in terms of how we're providing services or what the volume of services we're providing. Uh, and then we should have, you know, some way to track and measure these things over time. Like, are we meeting uh, our objectives? Are we, you know, satisfying our our commitments and our promises to the general public? Not, um, not, not novel at all, but something that the city of San Diego didn't really have a good handle on. Uh, there's no, I like to say, there's no way for you to really improve uh, unless you know where you're at today. You can't really do that without measuring uh, where you're at today. And I think there's a more concise quote. Uh, getting to that same effect from um, our friend Mike Bloomberg. So he says something similar, but um, it's just, again, the recognition that data should play a role in not only helping you understand where you are today, but where you want to be in the future and then figuring out how you're going to get there. So now for the, I think some of the really cool stuff that we do on our data and analytics team, um, this is talking about on this, on this slide here, you're looking at a chart that's, um, trying to kind of give you an idea of how we're approaching our work with regards to streets. So um, for the city of San Diego, you know, we've got thousands of miles of collectively of roadway. And um, what we're looking at in any given year is, you know, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of paving, you know, maybe a hundred or so miles uh, are repairing that much, uh, those many miles of streets. And so um, the previous mayor, Mayor Kevin Faulkner had this goal of wanting to pave a thousand miles of streets. It was a very arbitrary, uh, don't tell anyone I told you this, it was a very arbitrary um, thing that he set, a goal that he set, not grounded in data whatsoever. But after he left office, we were able to take a look at the data and say, okay, well, did we, did we pave some, but did we pave a thousand miles of roadway? We actually did. Um, so he made good on that, but there's a deeper story there, which was well, how did we determine what streets to repair? Did we get the return on our investment or the biggest bang for our buck? How was that work actually com completed? And then when you start to kind of dig deeper and do some analysis, you see that um, the numbers tell a very different story. So on this particular chart, you're looking at the number of miles that were repaired or repaved there in green uh, for every fiscal year going back to FY14 when he made that commitment. Um, all the way through FY19. And then in blue, what you see are the operating actuals for how much money was spent collectively to make those repairs. So what you see here is that um, the, the amount of money that we spent does not mean, you know, it, did we, in certain years, if we spent more money, did we necessarily pay more miles of road? And the answer is no. And you can see that very clearly from this chart, which is again, nothing fancy. And there's a, there's a deeper story here. Um, but the point was, is that you know, what's going on and you start to dig deeper and it's like, well, different types of repairs cost different money. Uh, in any given year, the, the, the resources that you need or the, the um, blanking on my words, the resources or um, for repair, you know, your, your individual components may be a little bit more expensive. What does it take to, you know, fill a pothole now? What is aggregate cost in this particular year versus, so some of these underlying, you know, factors kind of play into the overall amount of money that we're spending. So what we're really trying to get at is, you know, is this the most efficient way? How how are we actually prioritizing our, our roads as we think about repairing them? And so we dug a little bit deeper and now what you're looking at are, the way we talk about streets is by functional class. And so everything from a highway um, all the way down to like an alley or a bikeway, these are all different functional classes of streets. And so on the left-hand side, you'll also see that they're divided into high usage streets. So things like a, a, six, a six lane highway, um, all the way down to a low usage street, which would be like a bikeway or an alleyway. Um, in green, what you're looking at is the percent of miles for each of those classes that need that is in need of repair. And in the, the segment that's grayed out, it's the percent that was paved or repaired uh, over this time frame. So, I mean, Clearly, just to point out, you can see, for instance, uh, the two that we've highlighted in a darker green are residential cul-de-sac and residential local street. Well, what's wrong here? You see that those are both low usage, functional class streets, but we've done the majority of the repairs on the streets. So you can see that they have a higher than average 
share of, of the roadway that was repaired. And when you want to look at why, why that happens, the truth of the matter is, um, think about how, you know, kind of civic engagement, public engagement works. You know, you're reporting on your street. Everyone lives, if you live in a house for the most part, um, or a condo or an apartment, and you're on a residential street. Uh, so people are going to be more likely to report things that are close to them and affecting them. So all of the times that people are reporting things through Get It Done, or they're calling their council member because they've got potholes right outside of their front yard, you know, right outside of their driveway, those are the things that have been getting more attention uh, in favor of some of our other more highly used um, street assets. And so while it makes sense, there's obviously a geopolitical component to the way the city does its work. Um, from, a, from a kind of fiscal standpoint or return on your investment standpoint, it's a really hard case to make that this is the right way that we should be doing our work. The assets that are getting more usage that are more likely to break down, that are more likely to cause serious accidents are kind of high traffic corridors, major highways. And so we, sh we made the recommendation to the new mayor that there's probably a better way for us to be thinking through the, the, the determination of how we save our streets, not because residential streets aren't important. Again, everybody, most of us are probably interacting with those types of you know, um, assets more frequently than some of these other things. But the point is when you've got really limited or constrained resources like city does right now, and we're cutting money from a lot of budgets, including from transportation, just because of the massive budget shortfall we're in right now, um, how you prioritize your work really matters. And if we really want to be good stewards of taxpayer resources, we should really be thinking about how we are actually um, completing that work. And so lastly, what we actually did coming out of that, again, just another kind of simple tool that we've created for um, departments here is kind of a street map. And so what we do is for the transportation and stormwater team, uh, they've got folks, you know, we're talking about hundreds of folks that are out on the field every single day doing things from repairing streets all the way to graffiti abatement. So actually um, cleaning up and, and removing graffiti uh, and everything in between, weed abatement, every, anything you can think of. And so we started to create a map or we started to create tools for them to better um, enable their kind of workflow and make it more data driven. So what we basically do, obviously this is a static um, shot of this map, but we kind of prioritize streets by functional class um, and also by the age. So we use something called the overall condition index. And what that tells you is relative to the street or, or a particular class of roadway, relative to its age, um, how, how badly is it in need of repair? And so these are the types of tools that we create to help departments be a little bit more data informed. We're still working with them on this one in particular. We found out later on that the way transportation and stormwater would do some of their work was they would they they use the map they would pull up a map and where what they would do is they would actually just go pick an area pick a you know small enough uh, geographic area within a neighborhood and then go drive there and kind of just see what was up and scan for for problems again uh, for all of us that care about things like the environment and like GHG emissions having these big trucks out there just driving around doing stuff is probably not the best way. Um, to achieve any of our goals. It's not, you know, fiscally, you know, it's, it's not efficient um, and it's also a major source of pollution. So we're always working with departments to help them improve their operations in ways like that. Um, coming up, just kind of wanted to talk about the breadth of the things that we've got going on, but um, a few kind of notable things. The first would be that we are releasing an update to our, to our Get It Done app to, to make it Spanish. We're, it's, we're calling this version Spanish mobile app. So um, really optimizing this application now to function in, in multiple languages, which is long overdue, but um, we'll go a long way to making sure that we give the public all the ways that they can to engage uh, with us. We are also working on a sentiment survey for our own employees. Uh, this is really looking at the fact that life has changed um, dramatically for all of us in the last year. And we are always wondering how our workforce is feeling about that. Do they feel like they have the information they need? about where we're at in the pandemic, do they have the resources? If you're working from home, you know, do you have an acceptable setup? How would you feel about coming back to the office? Like, what would it look like to you if it was mandatory to get vaccines? All of these things, um, this is actionable data that our department leadership will benefit from greatly. We're doing a pay equity study. So this is a, we actually just concluded that, a historical look at 
the, the, the pay gap along race and ethnic and gender lines for the city of San Diego it had some really interesting findings that there is very much still a pay gap. Um, we can explain most of it. There's about 88% of it that we could explain. The rest of it was due to bias, um, not necessarily intentional bias, but there was an unexplained portion. Um, so, you know, in academia, the, the bias is the, the remaining piece of that there. And then we're doing surveys around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so this is now thinking about where we're headed as a city. Uh, do people feel like they can show up to work as their true authentic selves? And are they supported in, you know, who they are? And do they feel like they can present as such and, um, you know, get the, the respect and kind of dignity that they deserve? So there's a lot that we're doing um, across all of these fronts and goes beyond you know, just, you know, some, some, sometimes great, sometimes mediocre dashboards. It's really now moving the city to a place where we're trying to drive some of that change in the short term and in the long term. And it's happening kind of all in the way of being informed um, with and through the use of data. So um, moving forward, we've got some, some bigger things that we're looking to pick off. The city of San Diego doesn't have a centralized customer service, um, customer service kind of resource or, um, you know, like a call center of any sorts. And so we're finding ways that we can help departments be more responsive uh, to inquiries that they're getting. Again, all for the sake of providing not only a better customer experience, um, you know, for the inquiry, but actually providing better services overall. So probably something that it's odd that your data team would own that, but we are really kind of sitting at the top, looking across all these departments, looking at the bigger picture holistically, how all of these things fit together. So we figured we would just insert ourselves into that conversation to, to make sure that the residents in the, in, the, in the citizens of San Diego have a better experience when they're interacting with us. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about, oh, I'm not gonna read the words on the page, but just some other things we're thinking about and we'd love to kind of open it up to hear really questions or thoughts or suggestions from you all. But you know, we're really primarily focused on where are there gaps in decision making where we think that data can play a valuable role? Um, I'm hugely excited about kind of our shakeup, uh, the oral chart for the city with the new mayor. Um, again, you know, Mayor Todd Gloria coming in at the end of last year. Uh, we were moved to a new position in the org chart for the city where we report jointly directly to the mayor. Uh, so on the policy side, and we also report to the chief operating officer, which is the operations side. And so the, the thought is, again, very simple um, in concept, is that if the mayor sets out this you know, bold, long-term vision for the city, where we want to be in four years, where we want to be in eight years, where we want to be in 20 years, the people that are doing that, um, he is doing that with and through all of the 11,000 people across the city of San Diego. That's our workforce, 11,000 city employees on the operations side. And so there should be a really tight connection between policy decisions and operational decisions. And we think that happens through the use of data. So my job is cool because I get to sit in meetings and listen to people talk about how great it would be to do X, Y, and Z and all these things that are happening. And then I say, well, how are you gonna make that happen? Let's connect that. What does the data tell us? What can we do better? How are we gonna get there? And so it's, a, it's an interesting place to be. Um, but we're, we're giving it a go and uh, there's a lot that we're looking forward to doing hopefully with this mayor over the next four and potentially eight years. So I'm going to shut up now because I've talked at you for a long time and I would love to just open it up for um, any questions, any comments and kind of go from there. Awesome. Thank you. Um... <laughs> So uh, I've gotten a couple of questions from folks, but I want to let them unmute themselves. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand um, if you have a question or a comment. I've got a couple, but I want the students to be able to focus first. I know there were a few. Anybody want to speak up? Kenton, go ahead. Hi. Uh, first off, that was a really great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, second, you, did you say that we can explain 38% of the bias um, in hiring practices? 88%. So yeah, our findings were there is for pay, for pay for the city. Uh, and there are pay gaps and there are pay uh, disparities between um, uh, for simply white and minority folks across the city, as well as for 
females, males and females across the city. Um, and so yes, with the study that we found, we were able to uh, explain the source of about 88% of kind of the, the, those underlying factors contributing to the pay disparities at the city. If it's okay for a follow-up, what counts as an explanation for those kinds of things? There's actually a, the first, if we can, you want to take it uh, real nerdy, we can go get real nerdy on you. So the first, the biggest piece of the gap was explained by something called occupational sorting. So um, occupational sorting is really the recognition that um, people choose to take certain jobs over others. Um, there may be reasons why, there may be, you know, societal factors or barriers, but uh, for the city of San Diego, there are three job classifications that represent more than 40% of our total workforce. It's police, police, uh, fire, fire recruits, and then clerical or administrative assistants, so um, admin aides. Those three occupation groups account for, again, more than 40%. So the, the reason why that's important is because if you look at police and fire, particularly police, that's a much more highly paid occupation group than clerical or admin assistant. But what you see is that the profiles for people that are more likely to occupy those jobs are also very different. So there are more sort of an over-representation of white males in police and fire and an over-representation of women and people of color in positions like admin or clerical assistant. And so just because you've got these over-representation of these two groups uh, across these, you know, one highly paid and one lower paid uh, job classification group, what you see is that due to this occupational sorting, that is contributing uh, a substantial amount of, of the explanation. That's one of the major explanatory variables for the, the gap in pay for the city of San Diego. There were a couple other ones, but that was the biggest one. The next one was uh, parenthood penalty. So similarly, um, you pay, uh, it, not a penalty as in, you know, you, you, someone's taking money away from you, but just again, in the academic sense, that when you look at the numbers, um, women, particularly um, you know women of color, you can expect to earn less in your role once you have a child, and there are reasons for that. But that is another explanatory variable for that pay, for that pay gap. And then the last one was overtime. And so what you see is that there are certain occupations, again back to police and fire, um, that are more likely to take overtime. Sometimes it's mandatory overtime, but when you take additional hours, that is additional pay that then factors into your total compensation um, as an individual. And so that's another piece that's explaining the pay gap is that there are certain occupations that people are taking or consuming more overtime, boosting their pay. And so those were the explanatory variables. Now within that, it's not to say that these things are okay. There are certain things that the city should and could be doing, uh, for instance, to increase pathways, You know, maybe for instance, finding ways for people to grow into new roles or to take a step up in their career from maybe some of these lower paid positions to higher paid positions. There is um, you know, probably more that needs to be done to look at how we're recruiting for uh, talent. So are we actually hitting for kind of um, you know, certain communities, whether they're low income, whether they're minority, are we promoting and advertising jobs at the same rates in those places and targeting you know, communities in those ways to increase the likelihood that we would see more people of color in, in these kind of higher paying positions. But the underlying report, the, the findings were that we at least understand why there is a, a gap in pay across these different groups for the city. All right, thank you. That was, <laughs> there's an interesting chat going on about a class here at UCSD on economics of discrimination uh, that teaches some of this stuff. This is fascinating. Uh, the next one I saw was Gregory and then Patrick, you can go after Gregory. Oh, hello, I just wanna say it was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. And so my question is about the risk analysis. So I know you mentioned that some of the roads were prioritized over others, but I'm also interested in knowing, was there a, sp a specific spatial distribution of which roads were maintained and repaired over others? Like for example, the wealthier areas have more priority in having um, roads repaired and not, or versus uh, like less lower income areas. And if so, how can we maintain like a more equitable way of ensuring roads are repaired on a more uniform basis across the city? Great question. Uh, this is something my team and I talk a lot about. Um, so to answer your question, you know, directly, yes. 
there is a difference and this is coming I'll, it'll come back to kind of this kind of geopolitical way that we do our work you will see from the data and from the analysis that we did that you have more roads being repaired more frequently in higher income communities now when you try to understand if this is sort of intentional bias what we found was that people in wealthier neighborhoods and a lot of what we're looking at is kind of at the zip code level are more likely to be reporters of problems in their community so this was not unique to streets street repair this happens across a variety of other report types and so to, to us we're talking about this as a as a data team and a technology team how we are increasing public engagement and participation so that people feel comfortable contacting us in communities that might be lower income in communities that you know maybe across the whole either linguistic you know linguistically isolated so language barriers um, other socioeconomic conditions but the the point was is that the way that the work is prioritized for a lot of departments because they try to steer clear of being geopolitical reports come in and for like a streets the way that what would happen is as soon as something comes in it's sent out to the responding department and it just gets put into their queue and so they're actually for a long time they were just doing work based off of the order in which reports are coming in so you can see very quickly that if la jolla has got 100 reports coming in and barrio logan has got one you know, La Jolla is going to keep getting bumped up, bumped up, bumped up just because they're taking them as they come into the system. So we're always thinking about on the back end, making sure that first and foremost, you can't make people report things, but you sh we, sh we do have the responsibility to make sure that our technologies and our tools are as accessible as they can possibly be and understanding that different communities have different needs that are unique and based off of their own conditions. And, you know, there are cultural considerations, all of that people aren't always, um, one thing we're struggling with as a very much an aside to your question, but I think important to note here is that we're focused on technology, but I'm focused on the fact that coming out of the pandemic, we still have a long ways to go. And we know that the digital divide is real. Um, we are working through the fact right now that a lot of people don't even have a reliable broadband connection. And during the pandemic, the fact that we're all talking right now on Zoom and kind of remote learning, uh, we're finding that, you know, if at this point in time, regardless of kind of how we come out of this and life may return to normal and we're doing things in person again, broadband access is as fundamental to your 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 well being and you achieving your economic potential as having you know running water and electricity and we don't treat it that way yet. And so my job as chief innovation officer is to always remember too that we are doubling down on technology, but we still have to increase and keep lines of communication open for people to engage with us in other ways. But to your question about streets, you're right about how the work is being done, but again, not because of intentional discrimination, just more of how they process reports as they come in. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Patrick's question was answered already. So William, uh, you're next. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation again. Uh, I was wondering if we talk a little bit about, uh, I'm not sure if I missed it at the beginning, but uh, your trajectory into this position. Um, and I guess like any, any general advice you'd have for students looking to, you know, find their first job and um, like how to sort of build these initial networks that sort of um, get you into these roles. Yeah, great question. Um, my background, the nice, I think the really cool thing about my background and then also my team is that we all come to it from a very different place. Um, when I was in when I was in college when, and then when I went on to pursue my master's data science wasn't really a I mean it was obviously a thing but it, there weren't programs dedicated to it yet so a lot of folks have come into it from different channels I think in a lot of ways you guys are kind of ahead of the curve because it's in high demand and it's very important but let me tell you about my background and then why I think it's important to sort of broaden you know your experience in terms of um, your classes or your you know any of the the other parts of your curriculum that, that you're interested in. Um, I My background in, in undergrad was in the JAR department. So regional development, which is sort of a mix of um, kind of spatial studies, so GIS, but then also kind of like urban planning. So it's always, my background has always been sort of in very much kind of placemaking or place-based context, just understanding how cities work, understanding that cities should be designed for people, uh, not cars. Cough, cough. So really, I've always been interested in how to make the city a better place, how to make the world a more livable place for all people. 
um, I kind of doubled down on that in grad school and went through an urban planning program um, with a focus in demography. So for me, I've always been very much interested in the data, <clears throat> excuse me, a very quantitative, um, I went the quantitative track. So that's kind of how I found myself. Um, I'm particularly interested in things like migration and how, you know, labor participation, labor force participation and rates, all these things affect these macro systems like our economy. So I kind of went a more kind of, again, quantitative route to really be able to better kind of make sense of and analyze the things that I was seeing around me uh, in my community. Um, I then spent, you know, the beginning part of my career um, in, a, in a couple of different jobs, but the earliest, you know, the, the biggest stretch was at Sandag where I kind of fell into long range economic and demographic forecasting, which was, I mean, it's, you know, technically rigorous, but it was also, I really liked the applied piece of that. I was, you know, behind the scenes working to build models to predict the most natural or likely places for future housing development based off of things like employment centers and land capacity and all of these other things. So, um, you know, these really fun, nonlinear, simultaneous million, you know, equation models plus some gravity stuff looking at where things are going to concentrate. So having the technical skills was certainly helpful there. And I sharpened that um, while I was working there. So that's where I really started to realize there's only so much you can do with an Excel spreadsheet. So that was kind of my, um, you know, way to fall into data science. And from there it was, you know, taking, I fell in love with Python when I realized that I would sit for hours making these maps by hand and I could build a script to automate stuff. Like then I was just in love. I'm like, there it is. So, and then it was just more, a whole lot of, um, you know, doing some more quantitative stuff on the job. So I had to go back and do refreshers and stats and, you know, um, you know, some other not fun things. And I'm not, I don't love math, but I understand the applicability of it. And you get to a point where you just can't avoid it. And so um, you put it all together and then, you know, you can do some other training for things like Tableau or Power BI and stuff like that to figure out how to package it. But like for me, my path was, I had an interest in places, um, was more quantitatively inclined and then just got to places in my career where I had to continue to build my skills. And a lot of that happened on the job. Um, so that's a plug I'll make too. I think you guys are all thinking about your steps after school, but just recognizing that school never really ends. You'll be lifelong learners because that's just the nature of our economy. Um, and so today, now, you know, where I'm at, I'm at the city and I would say my suggestions to get to the second part of your question or, you know, um, advice I would have, I, I try not to give advice because I'm just trying to live my life like you all and do the best I can. I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but if I could give some advice, it would be um, make sure that while I think you all are probably developing um, all of your hard skills, I think I know the program is giving you a lot of that training. Just remember that when you get to certain points in your career, the hard skills are going to be important because you're going to probably be managing people and teams that are going to be responsible for doing that type of work every day. But it's really, really important to really hone your communication skills. And so I would say that where I've gotten into my career right now at this level as chief innovation officer, like I can tell you, I'm the, the worst programmer on my team. You know, I'll get it done. It's going to be hacked. No one, you'll never get to read any code that I write because it's super messy. And you're going to tell me you could have done it better and more efficiently and less buggy and that's fine. Um, but I can get the job done. I can have the conversations with the team about, you know, theoretically how things should be done. But then I marry that with the actual context. Like I sit in meetings with the mayor uh, weekly and the mayor is very much focused on improving lives of residents and doing public outreach. And he doesn't care about anything that we're doing behind the scenes. He just wants the data and the information that's gonna help him do his job better. And so it's kind of leaving all of that stuff behind the scrums and all the, you know, jams that I'm having with my team and then being able to go with a handful of visualizations, presenting that effectively to the mayor that's saying, Mr. Mayor, in the five minutes I have with you, here's why this is important. Here's how it relates to a policy that's shaping up. And here's how we can support you moving forward. And this is going to help you achieve your goal because of this. That's where I feel like you can see there's kind of it's kind of a place where you see the divergence between um, folks that want to be down in the weeds, which please don't get me wrong, like that's just as important. I have folks on my team that, you know, you could, you could keep, they could stay locked in a closet all day, every day at their computer. And like, that is all they want to do. They just want to work on building the things that is fine. And there's a role for that. And we need them. They are very important. And I always make sure that 
I'm elevating my staff so that they get recognition, even if they're not the person that, in the meeting on the front lines, like people need to know that their work is very important. But at the same time, there has to be someone that can effectively communicate all of those findings. And so I spend a lot of my time, um, more time than I would like, because I really enjoy all the fun stuff I get to do with my team. And I really do enjoy trying to solve problems and break things. Um, I spend my time increasingly in rooms with executives. And so I would just say, my advice would be to remember to focus on your communication skills, how you take something in your brain, knowing that for many of you here, you will always be the smartest person in the room. Um, how do you communicate findings in a way that doesn't make you sound like the smartest person in the room that's super arrogant? Um, just giving people information that they can use and making them feel comfortable to ask you questions. That's the other thing too. People have to understand and know that you're there to help them. So practice communication skills, put yourself in positions where you're doing public speaking or you're talking with other people that are just not data people trying to see if they understand the way you explain something if that resonates with them seeking out either internship or job opportunities that allow you to do that too i think is helpful um it just gets you out of your head a little bit um and you know sometimes i tell my team i joke with them like they'll say something and i'll say okay now tell it to me like a human being um, I don't want the computer speak or the super nerdy stuff, like, because that's no one's going to understand what you're saying. So that would be my one piece of advice. Can I just add really quickly, uh, and then Ted, um, for this is sort of like insider information, I guess, but two days ago, our PhD program in data science just got approved uh, by the Academic Senate. So uh, it has to be formally, formally approved by the University of California itself. Um, but given that it was a unanimous vote by the Academic Senate to approve it here at UCSD, it seems unlikely that it won't. So um, if everything goes relatively on track, that means that um, uh, people will be able to do a PhD in data science. It's one of the first uh, like data science specific. It's not in computer science, it's not in math. It's a data science specific PhD track uh, program. It's not a track, it's not a specialization. Um, that's taking a lot of what Kirby was just saying and distilling it down into a, a into a formal program, right? It's it's learning the technical side, it's learning the communication side, it's learning how to specialize, it's learning how to communicate. Um, and so, if everything goes smoothly, the applications will open up uh, this fall and winter uh, for starting in uh, fall of 2022 as the first PhD data science uh, crew. So that's that's an opportunity that's also coming forward. Is in addition to internships and all that kind of stuff. If you really want to dig deep. Uh, into into data science and data visualization and all these sorts of things. Uh, we're trying to distill out uh, the advice that Kirby's writing, Kirby's giving that we, we hear uh, quite a bit from another of people uh, and organizations and companies and say, okay, let's focus on these skills now. So uh, pretty exciting. Anyway, Ted, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the awesome presentation. Uh, you mentioned that you, your team was creating dashboard for different data set or for different departments. I was wondering, do you guys have like a generalized procedure for creating those kind of dashboard? Like I'm gonna make a bar chart for certain kind of data or is that really depends on the data set or the departments? Yeah, we do. So it, it's, um, we do or we don't. Um, we try to be flexible, but I'll tell you, we have um, on my team, our chief data officer and she um, also has a background. She does a lot of things. Um, again, primarily they're focused on maintaining, enhancing the architecture of our open data portal. Um, but then also, you know, in, in processing all of the data sets that we are across the city to host on the data portal. Uh, but she also has a background in journalism, so communications and UX design. And so she is always um, very acutely aware of, of ways we are presenting information. And she does have some standards for, and they follow, I think, you know, these these aren't unique to us is what I want to say. I think there are some standards for visualizations, especially what types of charts to use and which types of context. Um, but we do have some pretty loose standards for that. And of course, consistency for things like, um, you know, our, our colors and our scales and the way that we're formatting, some formatting stuff, I should say. Um, but with that said, do we have a, a standard procedure for the way we approach dashboards? I will say we have loose some loose visualization standards for our department, as I just mentioned, but then the procedures that we follow, I think here's where it kind of opens up. 
step one for me and what I have my team do is we, we approach it the way we approach like software development, like an app that we're building is gathering requirements from your user, which is a fancy way of saying, go talk to people about what they want to see. I don't let anyone build anything on my team until they've talked to the end user. What does that person need? What does that person want? What is that person's baseline understanding of data? If you put this chart on a dashboard for them, are they gonna understand how to read it? So um, there's a very kind of human-centered design aspect to this too, which is go talk to someone before you build a thing. It's okay to build something, you know, a, a prototype or something preliminary to have some people who are visual learners. Like I like to see something to poke holes in to say like, oh, this doesn't make sense to me. Or like, what if we display it that way? Users, some of your users or your, your consumers or your customers, whatever you'd like to call them are the same. Um, build something for them and then let them kind of tell you what works and what doesn't work. But point being is we, you can't build, we, I don't let my team build things and walk away from them. So when we talk about those reports that we build, um, some folks get reports and those reports might be, you know, a, a, some static images, static polls of these dashboards in the body of an email because that's how they consume information. Some people like to get it to the phone. So we started automating alerts, like tech, just text alerts to people where they can get their update and we push it out automatically to, to a text. And it may just be one chart or the one graph that they want to see on a daily basis. Some people, we have, you know, an enterprise license for Tableau. And so some people, we will actually build them a dashboard, like we've built the mayor a series of dashboards, because I know that he may go home at night and he does read anything you put on his desk. He is very curious. He loves data. With a little bit of coaching, he's up to speed and we can get him to, to review those dashboards. I know he might go home and have five or 10 minutes, have heard something in a meeting today and start poking around in the dashboard. So we do have some procedures, but maybe not necessarily in the not sure if it was in the way that you were kind of envisioning them. We have some standards for how we present information, um, you know, formatting, et cetera. But then in terms of the procedure for my team, it's really go talk to someone. Once you've built something, do a lot of follow-up to make sure that it's useful for people. Because I walked into a team, a brilliant team. Um, I've been at the city for a year and, you know, uh, 13 people on my team have been there longer than I have. And what I saw immediately was this land, like a graveyard of dashboards and tools, the coolest things you can imagine that we built that aren't getting used because it was never, who are we building this for? And what is the business purpose or need for this? So um, my procedure is very simple. It's make sure you have a need for something before you build it, then do a lot of follow-up to make sure people are using it. Okay, got it. Thanks, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, Kirby, that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll let everybody go here a couple minutes early <laughs> if there are no more questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to sit down with you at HDSI and actually chat a little bit more about uh, collaborating. So it would be, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, I don't know if you're involved in it, but congratulations on uh, whatever data team is behind the vaccine rollout in San Diego. It's going much better than many other cities. <laughs> um, we so. We're trying to make it better. We're trying to make it better. <laughs> yeah. Well done. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody. I'll send out the quiz uh, in a little bit. And uh, that's it. I'll see you all on Tuesday. <laughs>